first one is by Manuel Grande from Aberystwyth on asteroid mining. And Thank you. You know how to start that, I hope. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Right. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm also. Hang on. No input signal. Oh, there we go. Right. Um, I'm also going to shift uh, a bit in uh, that I'm not going to talk about detail so much as. Um, the challenges posed to the community by what is clearly a burgeoning uh, technological movement in terms of exploiting space uh, resources. So uh, if I understood what he had asked me to do right, it's to say what is in it for planetary science when we come to, to asteroid mining. So here goes. Um, I'm going to start off with um, Tsiolkovsky. Uh, seems a good place to start, uh, one of the pioneers of rocketry. Um, and around about 1900, he formulated a roadmap for the expansion of mankind into the cosmos. And he also did the rocket equation. Um, uh, so in, those of you who have heard people talking about delta V all morning, that's what delta V means. Um, he came up with 14 points in his manifesto. The seven first points uh, covered... Uh, development of rocket propulsion technology, and all of those were achieved by 1964. Uh, number eight was the use of space suits, and that was achieved by 1965. Um, number 11, I've jumped there, you can see, was uh, solar power for transportation in space. This is envisaged in 1900, which is um, going some. And that, again, was first... Uh, demonstrated to some extent in 1965, and as we've seen uh, this morning, uh, missions such as Smart One, Dawn, and so on, have um, verified that you can indeed use iron propulsion for um, real, you know, uh, cutting-edge space missions. And that's a technology that's really become um, viable over the last few years. But basically... After 1965, the remaining um, topics are space agriculture to make things to make um, uh, colonizers self-sufficient, um, Earth orbiting self-sufficient space colonies, as we know we have Earth orbiting colonies, but they're not space sufficient, exploitation of asteroid resources to gain autonomy from Earth, moving heavy industry from Earth to space, and a minor one, the perfection of, ma <laughs> of mankind and society. As you can see, we have made no progress since 1965. So, why am I here? Um, to a considerable extent, I'm here uh, representing Europlanet. Uh, some of you will know that Europlanet is um, a large European Union research infrastructure and in particular, what we are charged with is to weld together the European planetary community and help those people to join up with commercial enterprises in order to create more prosperity in Europe. Um, so I don't know if you can see very well this here, but one of our main objects, and the one that I'm responsible for, in fact, is innovation and foresight in planetary science. Um, you may also have noticed that asteroid mining is in the news, and this is from the middle of February, the, uh, uh, from the BBC Science and Environment website. It was actually, I think, on the front page of the BBC News. The Luxembourg government has decided that it's going to put a national priority on supporting space mining. Those of you who are of my age will remember that uh, will remember Radio Luxembourg. Uh, they actually said that they are viewing space mining as the thing which is going to carry on in terms of technology progress and job creation in Luxembourg, uh, other than banking, from Radio Luxembourg. Um, and so there'll be a major Europlanet workshop on asteroid mining in conjunction with the Luxembourg government. Um, and that will take place in either the end of September or the first week of October. So that's co-organised co the Luxembourg Ministry of Economy and Europlanet. So that's why it seemed to me that when, when Ian mentioned this that it was worth coming along and, um, and sharing some ideas. 
the, when we talk about asteroid mining, I'm going to jump rapidly forward now, although I will put in a couple of slides because I think a couple of, or one of the talks this morning didn't get given. Um, so if we're talking about resource mining, the first place obviously to start is near Earth objects. And there's a reason for this. Uh, if we ask what the delta V requirement is for a standard transfer from the Earth's surface to um, uh, low Earth orbit, it's about eight kilometers a second. You can find slightly different versions of these numbers in different places, curiously. Um, from low Earth orbit to a near Earth asteroid is about 5.5 kilometers per second delta V. You can actually find some asteroids that are as low as three, and some obviously are a lot more. To the lunar surface is about 6.3, and the moons of Mars is about eight. So you can see that the um, low Earth, or, sorry, the um, near Earth objects are a plausible place to start if you're trying to do asteroid mining on a low energy budget. Um, space mining is not only about mining asteroids or even the moon and then returning those resources back to Earth. The I think in many of these ideas, the core idea is that you can keep the resources in space and use them to explore the solar system. In other words, this is a, a stepping stone, and this is obviously what Tsiolkovsky thought for achieving some degree of autonomy from the Earth. And that's why water is so important. We've heard a lot about uh, converting water into propulsion, and so I'm not going to talk any more about that at all. Um, I was just going to name check a few missions that are out there at the minute because going to asteroids is um, uh, is something that's upmost in people's minds at the minute. In fact, quite a lot of asteroids have been flown by al already, um, and of course the Dawn mission has gone and gone into orbit using iron propulsion around Vestra and Dawn. Uh, in 2014, Hayabusa 2 was launched. Hayabusa 1, you remember, brought back samples from a near-Earth object. Hayabusa 2 is doing the same. Um, it uses uh, an iron drive. Iron drives are a key asteroid technology. The sampler is an upgraded version of the original mechanism, so hopefully it'll bring back a lot more than the few grams that Hayabusa 1 brought back. It has three small rovers which will be deposited on the surface of the um, of the asteroid so they can go around and investigate the mineralogy. Um, carrying an infrared spectrometer uh, and a radiometer and cam camera. Um, DLR will provide a, um, a small lander and a small impactor will also be provided with this mission so that a penetrator will be fired into the surface of, of the asteroid. So this is quite an in-depth um, investigation. Uh, return of the sample is due in 2020. OSIRIS-REx, which several people around this room I know know about, in some ways is on similar territory. Um, so this is going to go to an asteroid Bennu, which is a C-class asteroid, and return uh, and analyze between 60 grams and two, it says grams, it should be kilograms of Bennu to the Earth. Um, the uh, cost of this mission is about $1 billion, which is actually fairly cheap as such missions go. Um, uh, but it will also um, investigate natural resources such as water, organics, and so on. Uh, and these explicitly are stated in the mission objectives, uh, uh, the objectives of future space missions and economic development, uh, which will rely on asteroids for these. Um, the Asteroid Redirect mission, which is a spin-off, I guess, of the Orion program and the, um, uh, uh, and the idea of sending asteroids back, astro noughts, back to uh, near uh, lunar orbit is, uh, I nearly got it right, the, um, the idea uh, here is to um, bring an asteroid, or actually a boulder from an asteroid, back to near lunar space so that the astronauts can look at it. This is an incredibly um, ambitious mission which will provide several tons of boulder, uh, hopefully into a stable orbit around the moon in the mid-2020s. Uh, even more um, ambitious, perhaps, is uh, AIDA, or AIDA, which is a joint uh, 
European Space Agency and NASA mission. Um, so it's the Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment Mission. Bloody hell, I've had to get on. I've already got the marks for artistic interpretation and I haven't got started yet. Uh, CubeSats, very small. Look at this picture here. I think people don't have a feeling for how quite how small CubeSats are. Um, but the key technologies in asteroid mining are going to be iron drives, in situ water, water utilisation, nanosatellites such as these CubeSats, and autonomy, <coughs> very, very important. Um, Asteroid mining, therefore, I recommend these three science fiction books to any of you who write, read science fiction, um, particularly, well, no, I haven't got time. Um, the idea of asteroid mining is that you will collect three classes of material, gold and precious metals for transport back to Earth, iron and um, aluminium and titanium and useful things for sustaining exploration, and volatiles for use as propellant. Um, the idea being, and this is from Astorank, uh, there are two big um, asteroid mining companies out there, Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries. Um, this is estimated profit of trashing particular asteroids. Um, interestingly, Ryugu here is the first one that Hayabusa is going to. Estimated profit could be obtained is 35 billion. Uh, Antaros here, estimated profit into the trillions. And some of the asteroids, the profit is far greater than that. That, of course, relies on the fact that if you bring back a, a, a couple of hundred tons of more than that, of gold uh, and put it on the markets, the price of gold doesn't go down. Um, <laughs> What might be more useful, and the point of this talk is to talk about what, what, what's in it for us, uh, planetary scientists. Uh, one thing that might well become available is, uh, now the marks for artistic interpretation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is meteorite samples and samples of asteroids. Of course, asteroids are, um, meteorites do come very largely from near-Earth objects, although uh, clearly, the majority of meteorites come from Vesta, um, but, but there's a lot of overlap there. One, the sh thought that I really wanted to share with you at the end here is that actually you might say there's a strong analogy between metal detectors in archaeology and lunar, uh, sorry, and asteroid mining when it comes to bringing back samples and bringing in commerce to, uh, to something which was previously thought of as an academic discipline. Archaeology, obviously, originally people used to have enormous digs and loads of people used to dig stuff up. They used to um, describe the ground very carefully and like planetary science, context is everything for archaeology. Then people started being able to buy metal detectors and would wander around digging things up. A recent survey suggested that uh, these days only a, a couple of percent of what's dug up is actually ends up in, univer in universities or um, museums, you've distracted me now. However, battlefield archaeology <laughs> has benefited enormously from using amateurs and metal detectors. And it seems to me that we have to get into the same sort of discussion when it comes to what scientists might get out of um, asteroid mining. A good, another good analogy, which someone could ask me a question about, is fracking. Um, so, these are the things that we need strategies on now, and the um, commercial pressures for asteroid mining will only grow and grow. As a science community, we need to start thinking about what we want to get out of asteroid mining and how we articulate that, um, that engagement with the industry. Great. Thank you. Uh, if Colin could come up and be ready. Uh, we have time for a question. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Hmm. I loved your comment about prototyping, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, a great presentation, uh, but I disagree with a couple of points. <laughs> uh, but I, I think just the, one, one point to mention uh, about the idea of bringing mineral resources back down to the surface of the Earth, ignoring the issues of the economics of price dumping on markets uh, and then, then the fluctuation of, uh, of the costing there. The economic case only really becomes viable when the transportation cost 
is competitive to terrestrial trucking or rail, rail transport to get from a mine site to a production facility where it's needed. And we haven't even touched undersea mining yet as I a potential. I thought of that during your talk, as it happens. Yes. Um, it is uh, a tough I, one. I agree completely. I think that the, 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 the where asteroid mining will go is in in-situ utilisation. I think people talk about rare earths, for example. Rare earths are rare because people didn't realise they needed them until very recently. Now that they know they want rare earths, they're finding them all over the place. Okay, let's thank uh, Manuel again.